Neil. Yes. <laughs> Who would have thought that you'd be interested in asking people about sex? I know. <laughs> <laughs> who, would have, who would have thought it, eh? So can you tell us a bit about the genesis of the piece and the way the piece is structured? Um, Anna and her colleague Kate uh, contacted me and said, we're doing this exhibition about the history of sexology. It's going to be called the Institute of Sexology in homage to the destroyed institute created by Magnus Hirschfeld and famously burned by the Nazis. And they immediately had my interest and they said, we're looking to combine historic artifacts with work by contemporary artists to get people thinking about that connection between where we are now in our experience of sex and our talking about sex and the journey of all the great pioneering sexologists. I said, fantastic. Now, normally you get that call when everything's done and dusted, but this was unusual in that the exhibition at that stage was a collection of uh, ideas and some preliminary paperwork. So I was able to talk to them about where the show was heading. And right at the beginning was the idea that to make something that would last a long time. The exhibition runs for a year, and my piece is on show for 25 weeks of that year. And so I had the floor plan and the list of exhibits, and they were showing me mock-ups of how it might look and what it was about. And it seemed to me that the show needed an ending because explicitly it's a journey. It picks a starting point, the work of Havelock Ellis, uh, a writer whose work I already knew and really, really admired. I read him when I, uh, copiously, when I was writing my first book back in the late 1980s, my history of um, Oscar Wilde. And then it tracks a journey, a circuitous one, with some extravagantly weird um, backwaters. Detours. So you get Malinowski and Wilhelm Reich, as well as Masters and Johnson and Freud. Um, but it seemed to me the journey necessarily ended now, so I wanted to make a piece of work now. And then I, as Honor said, when I was snooping in the exhibition, because it was up and running for six months before my piece came online, I spotted something, which was every sexologist has used the same primary tool, which is to ask a lot of strangers about sex. Normally, under the same sort of conditions, where the deal is, tell me everything and I promise not to tell anyone else but I will publish it in a book <laughs> but I will preserve your anonymity now people have reneged on that deal in various creative ways throughout history and I went okay that's what I want to do I want to do a questionnaire um, where I'm going to put on a white coat and ask people about sex so that was the genesis and that, I mean, you're explicitly playing with the notion that any survey can be can be statistically pure, aren't you? You're 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 playing with that notion that that people have to be asked the same questions in the same conditions in order to produce something that's statistically meaningful for yeah. for scientific research. Yeah, although of course the emphasis in the sentence should be on the word playing, in that you could say, my, I'm sure. A statistician would say, my research, which isn't what the piece is at all, has no validity whatsoever because what's the sample? It tells you only what people who happened to want to go to an exhibition of the welcome think about sex, which is not the same thing as what people think about sex. But of course, in the in the show itself, you see equally 
peculiar and limited samples. Um, only really when you get to the heroic work of the Natzel questionnaires uh, in the 1990s do you see people for the first time in this country genuinely setting out to say what would happen if we asked everyone. Now, their results do have enormous statistical import. Mm. Um, mm. My piece is all process and no result. Yeah. Because <laughs> one of the interesting things that I've been able to, to do is get, get hold of a, a handful of, of the questionnaires, which right. are not, not ones with answers in them, but just blank questionnaires. Um, and that, that's one of the, for me, one of the really interesting things is that the questionnaire evolves. Yes. So question, if you haven't done it yet, you must. If you have done, you'll know that question 25 asks, if you could ask the other people coming to this exhibition just one question of your own about sex, what would that question be? And over the last, so far, 18, 19 weeks, uh, Neil, if I'm correct, you've chosen a new question every week to re-embed into the questionnaire. Yeah. So the idea is by week 25, the questionnaire will contain no questions from me, but 25 questions from anonymous members of the public. And the way the process works, it's, it's a lot of filtering because to date, just over 12,000 people have chosen to answer the questions. That's a lot of smut to wade through. <laughs> so I have a fantastic team of readers, some of whom are here tonight, four of my colleagues are here tonight, and they spend inordinate inordinate amounts of time every week reading every single questionnaire and then they cull from that what they judge to be of interest, value or sheer downright brazen oddity and they poke a quite large pile of that in my direction by email every week and then once every week I sit down and then I pick a question um, the criteria for picking the question are various. It has to work as a question. The object of the exercise is to provoke thought. So it has to be a question which provokes thought as opposed to a titter, for instance. And also then I have to keep an eye on the flow of the questionnaire, the, the geography, if you like. It, it can't become just scattershot. Here's a question, here's another question, here's another one, here's another one. That becomes exhausting. Because you want the questionnaire to be a journey in the same It has way to the lead you is. and it has to, if there's one question that's really heavy, the next one has to lighten up a bit. So you don't go, the visitor doesn't go, oh God, I'm not answering any more of this. this is too <laughs> get off my case yeah <laughs> so it's a curious it's a um well it's not that curious to me because it's about writing mm. so it's a fascinating weekly edit but i love the idea that i'm disappearing from the piece um, you're gradually being replaced by and being questions erased. from the like, public yeah 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 i mean lo lots of other questions uh, and also i'd I, I, I'd like to hear from the, the, the team who, who worked on the project about their, their thoughts as well, so, so we'll do that. But um, <coughs> paper-based, you made lots of choices about the questionnaire. You, you, yeah. you made it paper-based. You asked people to put it into a brown paper envelope. A plain brown paper envelope is very important. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk a bit about the, about that, about those choices? Well, it was, I mean, you know me, I love paper. I love paper, I love writing. I thought about what would be the ideal conditions of response. And it, we could have had a set of computers where you could have done exactly this yes. on computer and then it would it would have existed online there was something about 
being in an exhibition of artifacts. It's not, it's not an online exhibition. The exhibits aren't digital. They're in every possible media, but lots of them are, are, are artifacts and lots of them are archaic. And also I did want to connect particularly to the Natsel survey, which is the exhibit before my piece. And the naughtiness of producing a spoof, in effect. Um, working with the designers, we put a lot of effort into making a piece of paper that looks official. Yeah, it really does. People seem to really believe that this has some sort of medical or scientific or something white-coated status, <laughs> even though it's got this elaborately ludicrous title. And uh, <laughs> But it's got it's got all the, you know, these little boxes that they fill in, and it says 01062015 QV11 MVB, <laughs> which means absolutely nothing except <laughs> this is a questionnaire and it's very important. Several people have told me about the piece with completely straight faces. They've said, "Have you seen that piece at the Welcome?" Um, they have no, in other words, they have no idea it's by me. Um, people don't respond to this as a conversation with a person. I think, because we fill in forms all the time mm. and there's a very particular dynamic. I also liked, so I was thrilled when I was told that we couldn't have pens. We have to have pencils because you can't have pens because the room is full of priceless historic artifacts. So I don't know, someone's going to elbow a case and stab it with their biro. <laughs> no, we have to have pencil. So we have, we have pencils and pencil sharpeners and there's something childish about that. I love going into the show and seeing people <laughs> sitting there and doing, it reminds me of doing exams as yeah, well. Yeah. So all of that felt appropriate, it needed something tongue-in-cheek to make people think it's all right to do this. I think it would be a very different experience if at the end of the exhibit it was, now this is actually a real questionnaire, you know, from the department of whatever, or the welcome wants you to um, tell you, you know, your private medical history because they're interested in poaching that information for future use, whatever. I think it is a work of art, mm. not a... But, and before we, we go to the first bit of questions, I wanted to... For me, the one of the fascinating and also frustrating things about the work is that we don't have access to all those answers to 11,000 people's ideas about sex. Um, Actually, all we get is is this text here, yep. uh, with with the LED. If you can see in the, on the, the the shot, the LED, the the black and black and red, the red text and the black background, which changes ev every week. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to to hear your thoughts on on. In a way, it, it's a it's an iceberg of an artwork, isn't it? Yeah. The quest the questionnaire is just this is the thing that. And underneath yeah. that is all these people's thoughts and ideas. Yeah. I mean, that's made physical in the exhibit. There is the post box, and deliberately I made the post box of Perspex, so you can see, if you're in first thing on Tuesday morning, you'll see, oh, only four people have done it. And then if you're in on Sunday afternoon, I mean, it will be stacked up to here. And I love that as an artefact. As you say, it's, you can almost hear the paper rustling. Mm. with all those responses and it was important to me they would all be sealed in envelopes and posted it makes it a game but i wanted we decided to have or i decided to have this wall piece to stop people just as they were leaving the exhibition stop look at this so it's designed to be weird um <laughs> to make you go what i mean that's this is that's, quite an old one. This is quite an old version. That's the, of the end wall. of the. F that's the beginning of week two. Right. So that would have been on the Tuesday morning of week two. Nine days. In. Yeah. Um, whereas now it's day I don't know whatever eighteen sevens is I can't remember, um, and I wanted to immediately 
upset the convention. So the first fact is peculiar. I'll, re I'll read it in case. Yeah. In the last X days, X female visitors to this exhibition identified themselves as homosexual. In the same period, X male visitors reported that their sex life was making them unhappy. In answer to the question, is pleasure more important than love during sex? X visitors said yes, and X said no. X wanted both. X people thought and said things about sex that couldn't be adequately expressed as statistics at all. For instance. And, and then you get a scrolling display of about anywhere between 20 or 40 things that people have said that week. I mean, um, one of my bugbears on looking at other surveys and all forms of questioning about sex, I noticed that the first question almost universally is always, are you male or female? And I've never seen a questionnaire that begins, are you female or male? And that's stupid. <laughs> that's really stupid. So my questionnaire does begin, the first tick box question is, are you female or male? So I wanted to have women first, because uh, I really like women. And <laughs> I think that female visitors to this exhibition identify themselves as homosexual. But why would that matter? Why would you put that up as a statistic? Does it matter if these women are homosexual or not? Is 17 a large number? <laughs> <laughs> we laugh because it, that's an interesting question. I still think, you know, that's is the most famous statistic in sexology. Um, Kinsey's supposed statistical avowal that 10% of the population is homosexual. That was the w that's the one thing that everyone knows about sex surveys. Until Kinsey did that survey, nobody knew. Now everybody knows. Is it a large number? Is it a small number? What does it mean? And then the second one is male visitors reported that their sex life was making them unhappy. Is it surprising? Is that a small number? Is that a big number? Wait a minute. X is lesbian. Okay, that's a fact. X is unhappy. It's not really quite a fact, is it? It's does it mean today? Does it mean always? Does it mean always? And again, it's kind of interesting. How Do men often say they're un... I, it made me think. Do I and my male friends, do we talk all the time about sex making us unhappy? <laughs> or do we talk about sex making us happy? Or can't I tell the difference? Anyway, <laughs> that. And then the, the pleasure or love question, which upsets some people. Um, I was interviewed on Radio 3 last week or the week before, and the guy who was interviewing said, I couldn't help noticing a lot of people said they thought pleasure was more important than love during sex. And I was, I was like, uh, yeah, <laughs> sorry, sorry. But he was, you know, he's a married man and he was shocked. <laughs> he was shocked that so many people. And then I pointed out, well, actually, most people want both which I think is fantastic. <laughs> I mean, I would, I would be really disheartened if it was like 95% of people said they wanted pleasure and 5% said they wanted love and no one wanted both. That would, that would shock and depress me, but that's not the case. So it's all a teaser. And then the LED display is because it catches the eye and because you get this flood of extraordinary fragments of people's voices mm. where people say these exquisitely honest, unlikely, various things. And the only information you get about them is their gender identification, which is we off I offered people four categories, male, female, both or neither. Um, and age, because I think if, if someone says, I'm having the best orgasms of my life, I think it, you read that one way, if it's a man of 23, you go, oh, bless. <laughs> Have I got news for you? <laughs> and 
if it's a woman of 74, I go, ooh, uh, bravo, madame. Um, how fantastic. I, I don't, have I ever had a conversation with a woman of 74 about orgasms? I don't think so yet. So even... I withhold almost everything, but try and give some tasters. I mean, the only function of this is to persuade people, this might be fun, this might be interesting, pick up the questionnaire mm. and have mm. a go. I think what would be great now is if we could hear from the, the team who, who um, have read all, all of the questionnaires and indeed helped, helped Neil with, with the process. So if, you could, if we could have the microphone and if you could um, identify yourselves and, and also just say, say briefly what, you, what what's you're... What's it like? What's it like, yeah. <laughs> just, yeah, what's it been like reading, mm -hmm. reading them all? They're all too embarrassed to talk so they can whisper in my ear. <laughs> um, so we spent many hours. What's your name? Um, my name's Eleanor. Um, so we spent many hours going through all 12,000 surveys. Um, I think it's really important to say as well that we actually have to read every single one um, before they can be put into the library. Um, so that really explains maybe what an undertaking it is. Because of data protection? Yeah, that's among, right. Among other things, yeah. Um, so I guess it's important to say as well that they range from the incredibly serious um, where people expose things about themselves that maybe they've never told anyone before um, but equally, they can be extremely silly and fun and very playful. And any trends? <laughs> we were talking about this actually just before the event. Um, I think often what's been on television recently has a big impact <laughs> on um, what people are saying. So we think Casanova's been on television recently. Um, we've had a lot of Casanova fantasies um, in the last week. Um, we also had a series of fantasies about Genghis Khan. Um, yes. And that actually, that did follow a documentary um, that had been on recently that none of us had seen, but someone later told us and we thought, oh, okay, that maybe um, sh shows a pattern. Um, so that maybe shows how much what's going on in the world affects the way people answer them, even if they might not be aware of it themselves while they're in the gallery. If you haven't seen it yet, the Welcome, the Welcome, Fa the Welcome Trust has a blog, and there's a Sarah. Which one of you is Sarah Jaffrey? Sarah wrote a really terrific blog post about the experience of of reading reading the. Uh, the um, the surveys, but you also said in your post that um, you were surprised by the number of people who wanted to go back to ancient Greece or Rome in order to attend an, an orgy. <laughs> yes, we have. Uh, that's every week, and we just kind of hold it up and go, "There's another one. There's another one." There's just almost everyone, and we question their knowledge of history and what an orgy would have been like or what it would have been like to be or live at that time period. And But it's just almost always Greece and Rome, Greece and Rome, Greece and Rome. <laughs> almost every week, I don't know, what do you guys think? Like At least half of them every week. One in yeah. One in three. Yeah, yeah, okay, well, third, yeah. It's well, just like go. really wow. overwhelming. And I think the other trends we find from week to week, I mean, we were talking about how much um, in the past couple of weeks we feel that race and sexuality has, has emerged as a theme mm. for the past couple of weeks, and um, consent has been a huge one. And um, one of the questions Neil has replaced um, his survey is, is about consent. So that's been a really interesting topic to read about, and sometimes it can be quite moving to hear people's thoughts. Yes, and that, that's definitely the sort of more serious side of what people are confiding in the survey, isn't it? Yeah, it's a bit like a confessional. So sometimes <laughs> we have to walk away from them because they're quite difficult speaking to us. If you read 100 or 150 in a day, it, it, when you find one that makes you laugh, you <laughs> kind of washes over you and makes you feel much better. But it can, get, it can be taxing because what people say. Mm. Also, it's quite odd that the, your last two big projects have involved making other people read thousands of <laughs> submissions. Letter to an Unknown Soldier, all about the horrors of war. Yeah. And would you mind all about the horrors of sex? <laughs> Sometimes the horrors, yeah. Does it ever get too much? Do you ever have to stop in the course of a day? It depends. Um, 
Yeah, there's a few breaks every now and then, but yeah. you, 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 yeah, we have a time out between us and get things off our chest, and then we can get straight back yeah. to it. Mm. I mean, I found I'm not reading the quantity that you are, but I'm I spend time in the gallery watching people do it. Obviously, I get all of your reports every week, and also on several occasions we met and talked about it to keep in touch with each other about what's happening, and I. I sometimes have to come back to the sort of elementary principle of talking about it and thinking about it, and by it I mean sex, is good in and of itself. People are thinking about it. The times when I get depressed is when it's material where someone seems perversely to be not thinking. So when the question is, would you, would you ever pay for or earn from sex? If the answer is scrawled, yeah, sure. You want to say, that isn't why I asked you the question. So you could just brush that aside. So sometimes the anonymity I find frustrating. I mm. go, I wish I could get hold of you, madam or sir, and say, what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? You don't care who comes first. Nonsense. Of course you care. <laughs> Think about it. Talk to me. Wake up. Smell the coffee. Have better sex. You know? So it is a, it's a very curious thing. And that's, I think, I've just realised one of the reasons why I wanted it to be on paper. There's something about reading people's handwriting that makes a big difference. There's mm. an element of person in a handwritten pencil response, mm. which for me is not present simply on tapa tapa. Mm. Um, well, we'll come back and talk more about the sort of wider context of the of the work. But I wanted to open up to questions questions in the in the audience, um, at least in, initially. So, have any of you got any questions? Don't be shy. There's one there, and is there another one so we can get the microphone? There's one there as well. Uh, so we'll, hey. we'll do this question first, and then this uh, fellow here. I'm terrible at microphones. I'll probably jumble this up. Um, do we ever worry about the artist's responsibility in terms of you might open up a can of worms and people might pour out some kind of confession and then have to leave the exhibition with that kind of wound reopened? Mm. Um, well, I can't. To a degree, I can't take responsibility if that happens. I hope the tone of the whole piece is um, responsible, gentle, uh, dare I say it, playful in a particularly gay way. It's, it's got, it's, I mean, it's called, would you mind if I asked you a few <laughs> personal questions about sex? You know, so from the beginning, it doesn't, it isn't called, sit down, shut up, and spill your guts. It it isn't interro it yeah. isn't an interrogation. Um, it's a it's a peculiar kind of conversation. Yes, we have had times when people have written things um, where we've worried about them uselessly and by proxy, where your heart goes out to someone because you go. God, that is really crap, what someone did to you. And that's normally the thing that we find. Or where somebody says, I mean, uh, I find the stories where people say, you know, my family treated me really badly for 20 years, but now it's getting better. You know, because I've been through some of that and so's everyone else I know. So there are times when you do worry but, as I say, my answer was, as an artist, I took great care to make the piece uh, personal and safe. And we, we spent a lot of time talking through what, the, what were the mechanics of making sure that we could absolutely guarantee people's safety that there, there literally is no way, there is no way at any point in the process that you can identify anybody. And so that security was a very important part of the deal. 
and we we've been really scrupulous about that. Another question here. Hi, um, I was just kind of curious. In I guess in like maybe part of that that safety conversation, how you drew the line of the questions you chose, mm. um, and maybe if you could share examples of ones that fell either side of the boundary, if that makes sense. They were close. Which you mean appropriate and inappropriate questions, or, or, or whatever boundary, whatever reason right. you might have said, oh no, I'm not going to have that one, but I kind of want to, or anything like that. Have we ever done a... There was one conversation we had really early on, wasn't there, about a disputed response or question. Remind me, what was that, Honor? Can you pass the microphone to Honor? Sorry, this might inform on the answer. Can you remember? It's gone from... About the quote on the board. Yes. That's the query, and you're going to make me say it into a microphone now. The quote was, let's teach wanking in schools. That's right. Um, and it was yeah. the adjacency of the word wanking and schools. <laughs> and um, I wanted to publish it, and in the end we decided not to. Because it, as I say, the object of the exercise is ina to enable, encourage people to think for themselves. And we felt that that was a statement, bearing in mind that it just flashes past, that could, instead of open people up to thought, could close down avenues of thought. So that would be an example. I mean, really, all of my choice of questions is on that criteria of does it, is it constructive, would be a good way of putting it. Does it invite you to think? I mean, there's a level of talking about sex which is inherently uninteresting, I think. I mean, there might be circumstances under which the question, how many times did you come this week, might be interesting, but not really. It would have to be framed with it some other... It would have to have other, a context. It would have to, be, <laughs> it would have to have a context. Otherwise, it's just, you know... It's, you know, how big is, from a male point of view, <laughs> how big is your dick? Well, not inherently interesting. You know, what you think about that might be interesting. Why are you asking me that question? So trying to get questions that would, yeah, which have some resonance in them. A lot of the public, a lot of my questions were quite wordy, quite elaborate, quite, ooh, how can, I, how can I put this? The public's questions, I think, tend to be more straightforward. Yes, and that's reflected in this evolution of the question. Yeah. The questions have become more direct, more... More direct. Yeah. You know, should homosexual sex practice be taught in schools? Would you ever pay for sex? Do you think monogamy is natural? How often do you compare your sex life with other people's? How many times a week do you compare your sex life with what's on the internet? Um, Really, this is what I would, in response to my question, if there was one, only one question you could ask people. So I would say, I think that's right, isn't it? They tend to be more, um, short, they tend to be shorter and perhaps blunter than I naturally am. So another, another couple of questions. There's, there's one there and then is there Mike, another, another one for after that? Okay, one there as well and then we'll, Move yeah. On. So. Thank you very much for taking the time to come and speak with us this evening. Um, uh, I may have missed this in the initial gambit, but um, uh, sort of framing it in the context of this is obviously supported by the, the welcome, and, and I get this is art. Obviously, there's, there's a great resource here for humanity, you might argue. Is, is there any facility for us to actually, uh, or for the welcome to, to access this from the point of view of research, you know, sort of thematic analysis, or, or anything, or is, uh, any conversations around that actually happening? Or is any view? To use this it, great resource for that. It's been was built into the project from the word go. Every single one of the public's responses is being paper archived in the Welcome Institute Library and there's full access to that. So anyone who wants to use the public's responses for any purpose, statistical mining or just anecdotal impressions 
you know, I think one thing that's really shifting on the radar in terms of if I'd been doing this project five years ago, I think what what is grouped under the word transgender is much more visible, much more talked about, much more embraced than, as I say, in earlier periods of my life where that really wasn't, whereas now uh, all of, I get the sense that the public for want of a better word, is very aware of transgender lives and transgender voices. And the overwhelming attitude seems to be great, good, all, yeah, for, for nodding heads, yeah, generally all for it. And that's, that's a real sea change in the culture of the city, I think. So answer to your question is absolutely full public access to the entire project uh, from the day that the piece closes and it's all being it's all being filed away uh, the problem will be because it's on paper it makes it very difficult to mine for statistics the only way you can mine it is sitting down and reading it but it's it's don't it's boxed week by week and on the front cover you do get the age and the chosen gender category of the respondent. So if you want to know what women over the age of 40 responded to question 18 over the 25 weeks, you can actually dig down to that quite quickly, but not as quickly as you could if it was online. And a question there. Hi. Much of your work that I've seen in the past has taken a figure, a mythological figure, a real figure. Um, you mentioned Oscar Wilde, um, Simeon Solomon, who I'm studying at the moment, and uh, looked at what happened to them in society because of their sexual activity or whatever. Um, I'm wondering now, you seem to have changed in that you're taking a lot of stories and then locking them all up. Um, so <laughs> how do you see this affecting your work in terms of stories about people and their mythologies? Oh, I'm happy to say I have no idea. Um, <laughs> ask me in a few years' time or when I've produced my next piece of work. I have to say I, it has confirmed a growing opinion that um, th the truism that there are as many sexualities as there are people as there are individuals, is in fact a truth. There are tides of opinion, tides of emotion, there are structures, there are histories, but the actual individual lived, this person, this week, is experiencing this, is putting out this, is giving this, is receiving this, is placed here in the cultural economy of sex, that the, the absolute, uniqueness of voice um, really sings out to me. I mean, I'm more and more resistant to any pathologizing. Um, categorizing can be useful if we're doing it to ourselves, I think. In other words, grouping together, clustering, forming bodies, and then hiving off into new ones. But pathologizing anyone ever, I just go, I think it's over. I think it's over. And I think that's probably a new interest of mine. And I. That's very interesting in relation to the video work that's in the Institute of Sexology, your, your yeah. work, pedag Pedagogue. Uh, there's a very clear line between the two pieces, isn't there? Is there? I've, this is a video <laughs> piece of mine from the late 1980s that was made in the context of the campaign against Clause 28, and I made it illegally with a bunch of students of mine when I was working at the University of Newcastle. What do you see as being the line, the well, connection? <laughs> well, the, the voice that you take on in that piece is a, is a voice that's, um, that's disguising itself, that's telling 
that's telling what it thinks the interviewer wants to hear. Mm. Uh, both, so it's full of truths, but it's also full of falsehoods. Mm. Uh, like your favorite musician is Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so I think I mean it's not it's not a it's not a it's not a, a ploddingly clear straight line, but it, it's definitely a trajectory of yeah. of. And that, I guess that was one of the questions I wanted. I failed completely, failed to neatly delineate this talk into three parts. But one of the final questions I wanted to ask before, if there's any final questions from the audience, is 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 really about that trajectory and about how you see. Um, would you mind in relation mm. to your theatre work, your novels, the live art pieces you've yeah. done, the video work, pedagogue, etc. <coughs> Well, it must all add up somehow, but I don't know. I, I think one of the obvious shifts between pedagogue and Would You Mind and between my earlier fiction and my current fiction, my last novel, is um, in the 80s, I was, in a sense, I was working very close to home because I was part of... A, an, in, an endangered species, an embattled population. We were under a uh, threat from a newly identified disease, but from my perspective, much more significant. I mean, shit happens, okay? Disease is just random. But we were under much more significant attack by the cultural hegemony of this country on a daily basis, and that was manifested in everything from laws to uh, television programs to being beaten up at the bus stop. I, I always say, when people say, oh, wasn't it wonderful in the 80s, Mr. Bartley? Can you tell us about the 80s? Was it great? I say, well, the thing you need to know about the 80s is I didn't know anyone who wasn't beaten up. That's the most important single fact about the 80s, everyone got assaulted on the street. Um, and those days are, please God, not temporarily, those days in this country, in this city, are over. If we hear about one of us being beaten up on the street now, that is extraordinary, whereas then it was ordinary and desired by most of the population. So that allows me to breathe more freely and have a wider horizon. It doesn't mean I'm viewing the world from a different, I haven't become someone else, but it does mean that perhaps I can, I have the, the sorry, I'm not being clear. I have the security to talk about everyone. That's the difference. Yeah, I feel yeah. I'm allowed to talk about everyone. Yeah. Whereas... And this work is really a celebration of that, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. I, I love the word everyone. I love the word people. I love the word we. I love the word everybody. I think it's an amazing idea, everybody. Because I grew up when there was, there was us and them. And there was absolutely us and them. I was a category. I was a category. I was a pathology. I was a problem. I hope I'm still a problem, Kate. <laughs> I'm trying. So we have a bit of time for some more, some more questions. There's a hand up there. And is there a second question so we can get the microphone lined up? There's a lady there. OK, perfect. Should we go to the gentleman there first? Sorry, me again. Oh. Um, Sorry, I can't quite see. I would have prevented you if it had known it was a... <laughs> Make let's it quick, let's go to the on. woman here. Should I pass it on? Yeah. Okay. Madam. Um, I just wanted to ask you, when you get the cream of the comments from the, uh, my four my colleagues team. who are yeah. working on this, um, what criteria, if any, do you have when you pick um, those 20 or 30 odd comments? Because having worked at the exhibition, every week I come in and I just find it absolutely fascinating reading all the different comments, responses, 
And some are quite upsetting and in, but insightful, some are funny. And one thing I have actually noticed, a trend every week, is that you pick a real selection of ages from teens to uh, however old, 70s, 80s, whoever's um, yeah. participating in it. And I just wondered how you select those top 20 quotes every week, and is there a criteria? Well, good, I'm glad it comes across. Definitely, I, I want age range because I, one of the things I like about working here is the genuine breadth of the demographic of people who come in. I love that school parties and pensioners are part of a typical audience. That's really important to me as an artist. So yes, I pick, uh, I deliberately choose an age range and indeed the selection team is, we agreed that's something we should look out for. I want there to be a few laugh out loud because it's the hook. It's the thing that makes you go, where, these people are saying these things. Give me one of those questionnaires. What's going on? It's just, so <laughs> some of them need to be laugh out loud. So our, our favorite so far was, one of the questions was, once was, um, has anyone ever given you good advice about sex? If so, could you say where, when, and how? And our, all of our favorites was, my mother once told me, open brackets, during the antiques roadshow, close brackets, <laughs> that women have multiple orgasms. <laughs> Fantastic. How could you not want to know what was the question that produced that answer? You know, that's a great one. And then sometimes you just get, um, was it last week or the week before? No one has kissed me since, se since September 2014. Fantastic. Immediately I go, and is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, we, we strive for gender parity, and we, I'm always looking carefully, can I include people who've identified as both or neither? Because I think it's disappointing if everyone is F and M yet again, and we strive for gender parity, but quite often I go, fuck it, I don't care. All the quotes this week are from women, that's fine by me. Because sometimes, gender parity, but skewed towards female respondents, because I can, and because everything else is skewed the other way. <laughs> and so, sod it, <laughs> quite frankly. So that's, that's sort of, is that a fair account? Yeah, I think so, that's pretty much. Another question? Down here. Just here. Um, you've talked about how these questionnaires are evolving over the, the exhibition. Um, and so you've now got all these user generated questions. Is there a question now that you would like to ask that you haven't, that you didn't get to ask at the start? I have sometimes thought of going in and doing the questionnaire myself to see if my question would make it through the selection <laughs> procedure. <laughs> Is there a single, oh, that you've put me on the spot now. Is there a single question I would like to ask? No, I don't think so, honestly. I haven't, I haven't gone, oh, I wish I'd asked that. There are a couple of questions I'll be really sorry to see go, because they have to go. I do love the one which is, if there was a place and time in history you could travel back to, to have sex, where would you go and as whom? And I know it's always toga party, but I love that. There was a fantastically detailed one, which was from a gentleman approximately my own age, which, which said, during the Second World War, many servicemen came back to this country hungry, cold, and tired. I would like to have been there to comfort them. <laughs> And I could relate to that. I could relate to that. There was someone who wanted to be, she wanted to be Frida Kahlo having sex with Josephine Baker. <laughs> definitely, definitely, definitely. Great, so I will miss that question when it goes, which it will. So we have time for one one more question. Oh, there's lots of hands. 
Yes, that's great. Yeah, please. I'll hang around Thank afterwards. You. Just ask me. Yeah. Given your insistence that the piece is an artwork, how much do you want or not to actually contextualise yourself in the archive? Or is it simply Neil Bartlett and the name of the work? I haven't really thought about that. I think it can just be Neil Bartlett and the name of the work because then I think, well, one, there's an essay by me in the book of the exhibition where I talk a bit. So if it's a lazy person, they can just look that up and that will tell them a bit about me and what I think and why I did this. But um, anyone who wants to know what the context, how this fits into the rest of my work, I'd hope they would just go have the nows to go not to Wikipedia, but to my <laughs> website, which has full documentation of my work. But I haven't... I can see Honor is going, yes, Neil, that is something we should think about. I mean, <laughs> there, uh, there will be some kind of wrap-up process where the, the archive will need a front cover. It will need something saying, so this is how it worked, dates, duration, description of the selection process. I think people are going to need all of that. So maybe it will need some kind of artist statement on it. But one of the things I like about the piece is I'm not, I'm notoriously very visible in my own work, even in my written fiction. I'm always very present, I think, and people tell me I am. But in this piece, apart from if you know me, I think you recognise my tone of voice. But if you don't know me, it's convincingly anonymous, I think. Mm. Mm. Great. That's a good note to end on. So thank you very much to Neil for a wonderful you, conversation tonight. That was great. And thank, thank you. you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was great. Well done. Thank you.